Hello again. In the first video on oil economics, we went through some academic journal articles and looked at energy return on investments and some algebra and arithmetic that related price, energy inputs, outputs, cost to consumers, cost to producers, uh, market prices, and uh, how all of these factors relate to the business of producing and distributing oil to society. In this video we're going to continue on looking first at energy return on investment and how the decline in EROI is uh, affecting prices and supply and effect impacting how companies structure uh, their investments and how they prepare uh, develop strategies for a, a changing global economy. Uh, and then we'll look at how uh, EROI and pricing and other factors are look, are motivating people to look into alternative fuels as a long-term solution to uh, either declining oil supplies, as some people may say, or simply uh, impossible or declining efficiencies such that we there might be enough oil in the ground, but we just can't get it out uh, in an economical manner. And so declining EROI is a, of traditional fossil fuel, these articles say. Uh, they affect the world economy and they're likely to result in myriad consequences, uh, most of which will not be perceived as good. The world still runs on automobile. Uh, we still transport our goods, our people, our services, uh, our airplanes, they're all run on gasoline. And, and today there's really no substitute. Uh, we can move towards electricity and we'll look at some alternative sources, but uh, our options are relatively limited and then deployment of an alternative transportation system uh, would take decades in the making and so this is really crucial to how the global uh, economy continues to grow and function. So here's a nice, nice little picture. We have some, remember megajoules, these are our uh, thermal units or energy units. So we've got some stored energy in uh, the oil there and then we lose a little bit in extraction and then we lose a little bit more in refining and then we lose a little bit more in transportation and then we lose a little bit uh, and finally by the time the consumer gets it there's it's about one-fifth of the original energy value there and so there's energy consumed in each process here and then there's some energy loss right so EROI varies between different sources. It varies over time. Here, these authors are comparing several different energy sources. We're going to look specifically at oil again. All right, so world oil and gas uh, has, a, has a mean EROI of about 20 to 1. And now that's combining oil and gas, which really shouldn't be conflated because they have very different uses, especially when it comes to transportation. The ERI for production of oil and gas by publicly traded companies has declined from 30 to 1 in 1995 to 18 to 1 in 2006. So we can see pretty sharp declines. And the ERI for discovering oil and gas in the U.S. has decreased uh, from more than 1,000 to 1 in 1919 to 5 to 1 in the 2010s and for production from 25 to 1 in the 70s to 10 to 1 in 2007. Again, we're seeing declines. If you remember from the last video, we need uh, an EROI of between three and five in order to make um, petroleum uh, feasible fuel source to, to, for deployment out to society. Uh, and so if oil becomes so energy intensive to get out of the ground that we're not getting more than 300% gains on uh, the extraction process, then, then we're in, in some pretty deep trouble when it comes to transporting people and goods. So as the EROI for conventional gushers or regular wells, traditional wells has decreased. Uh, companies have also invested in tar sands and oil shale, right, which deliver lower EROI and they have a mean according to, let's see, a review of four publications, the EROI of four to one and review of 15 other publications. Uh, seven to one. So we're looking at between four and seven. That's pretty low considering that we have a bare minimum of three uh, and in some author's opinion five. All right, so we can see tar sands are, are pretty low here compared to oil and 
conventional natural gas. Shale oil is slightly bigger, slightly better. Uh, some people think ethanol is an alternative that has uh, that has utility for scaled production or scale consumption. Apparently, uh, those are somewhat misguided opinions, and that's that's an issue for another uh, video entirely. All right. So, further review of of articles from peer-reviewed journals. ROI of conventional oil and gas decreased in the mid-90s from 20 to 1 to 12 to 1. That's basically a repeat of what we had up above. And the ROI of combined oil gas tar sands is decreased in the same period from 14 to 1 to 7.5 to 1. And so we're, we're getting basically similar views from various different authors. And, th and that's how we really triangulate an issue and make sure that we're getting good data here, good opinions, is that when many different authors have the same data or come to the same conclusion. So we're, we're seeing general trends of decreasing EROI and then when it comes to non-conventional sources like tar sands or shale oil we're looking at uh, 4 to 7 or less than 10, 10 to 1 uh, for EROI. And so uh, in order to inspect, examine the issue of what these non-conventional sources are, I've pulled another article here uh, this is from Alberta, Alberta, Canada is famous for the tar sands. So they have defined two different types of extraction uh, from their oil sands. One is surface mining or in situ. In situ just means on site. Uh, surface mining involves the extraction of near to surface deposits about 70 meters deep. These deposits account for about 20% of the oil sands reserves in Alberta. The other 80% are not economical to recover by open pit mining. So in this in situ, they just dig a big hole and then uh, there's oil in the sand and they can uh, separate it by using steam. They'll, they'll, they'll inject steam, which separates the, the oil from the, the solids in the sand. The other 80% are not economical to recover by open pit mining. That's the big hole in the ground. And so they are situated at a depth of 200 to 700 meters. You can't dig a hole that deep. Uh, they require drilling wells and based on the viscosity of the bitumen, bitumen is that sand and oil mixture. And it's kind of like uh, asphalt that you might see being laid on the road. The possible use of steam or solvents to allow the bitumen to be brought to the surface. This type of extraction is for, referred to as in situ. All right, so surface mining is that open pit. They dig a hole and then they, they can take out the oil sands right there. And then in situ is uh, in the ground. They'll have to take it out where it lies. And so they've got operating costs here, right? Each of these each of these uh, companies, they've got various fixed and variable costs. They've got labor, uh, equipment, uh, supplies, materials. They've got to run their machines on gas, right? So in order to make a profit, they have a break-even price for that standalone mine. That's the open pit mine uh, of about uh, 75 to 85 dollars per barrel and so oil price needs to be at 75 to 85 dollars per barrel in order to make a profit there that's according to the Alberta Energy Regulator right uh, new steam assisted gravity drainage operation is the most commonly used technique for thermal in situ remember this is when it's deeper in the ground it's around 60 dollars per barrel and in contrast the break-even of these same types expansions is about $52 a barrel right and so we're looking at over $50 a barrel at any rate there each of these different operations different companies different methods uh, slightly different location there are a different number of variables relating to uh, their their costs and how difficult it is to uh, extract the oil where the oil is where the sands are how deep they are um, they would they would push up or down these break-even points but so we're looking at let's say fifty dollars per barrel minimum and uh, I don't know if, if you guys have been into the price of oil recently but in fact it is quite a lot lower than that here I pulled some statistics from Alberta government right so starting in January 1st 2007 through April 1st, 2020, 
I've got the production of conventional oil, non-conventional oil, and then the WTI, which is West Texas Intermediate Prices. That's a, a standard price on the global uh, market. And then WCS, which is, uh, if I believe, if I think it's West Canadian Select. That's a slightly lower quality of oil. Uh, and so those prices are typically a little bit lower than WTI. Right, but they follow along the same trend line. Here I built up some graphs using Excel. I've got two axes here, right? And this blue line is the non-conventional oil production. We can see general growth with some spikes up and down, and then we can see a pretty erratic price volatility. Uh, and just looking at the graphs, well, through through this time here, which is February 1st, somewhere along 2014, 2015, somewhere in there. Right. Excel's not telling me what year it is here if I, if I select the point. So uh, somewhere in about five years ago, 2014, 2015, we had some price drops, right? We moved, we were pretty high through 2012, 2013, 2014. Pretty, uh, been pretty steady on the low side since then and so uh, we saw some decline in production uh, remember that the break-even point was about fifty dollars so that's this range here and looks like WTI has been hovering at just about fifty dollars a barrel just barely profitable uh, so companies as it as the price sunk down below 40, companies reduced their production significantly right here, uh, just after the price came down. And then as it slowly climbed up over 50 again, they continued and probably banking on the fact that uh, they had some cash st stored up from these times when uh, profitability was pretty high, which uh, brought more companies, more competitors into the tar sands. Uh, into the into the market and so a lot of companies were storing up cash and able to um, give themselves a little cushion in case of a price drop like they saw right here and so they continue that trend upward and right now we're we're down at one point earlier in 2020 the, the it was a really odd market phenomenon happened the price of a, a barrel of oil was less than zero dollars it was a very strange situation um, just because the supply was so great uh, and there were a number of things going on with coronavirus that are uh, likewise affecting the price of oil, uh, not just the EROI. Uh, there are other factors affect affecting the price. Uh, and then we can see that in the past couple of months, then that production has declined again as the price the, the, the bottom dropped out of that price. And we can probably expect that production to continue on falling until it stabilizes above that break-even point of about $50 to $60. Right, I've run some correlations here with SPSS. I took this data, I put it into SPSS, and we see, of course, the WCS and the WTI price are highly correlated, and it's highly significant there. That's our p-value. But this value here is, is irrelevant. It's erroneous. Uh, and we can see by looking at the data, it, the data is... is it doesn't follow any real pattern. It's not, it's not normally distributed. There's no homoecidasticity. It's not hetero. It's, it looks like a random scatter plot here. And so I, I attempted to uh, model various, various regression equations, linear, logarithmic, growth, and exponential using SPSS. And the, these are all highly significant, but again, because our data follows no discernible pattern graphically, uh, we can't trust these. It may say that it's significant, but these trend lines do not actually follow the data. They intersect with various points in this data scatter plot, uh, but there are so many outside of that, that general trend line or curve there that basically there, there's no logic, uh, no relationship is found no strong relationship so far is found between uh, the the production of 
non-conventional and the price of, non of, of WTI or WCS on the world market. Uh, other than that, we can say as price stays below that break-even point, then of course companies will not be able to make a profit and so they will have to stop producing that non-conventional oil. Um, similarly, I mean, our break-even point with conventional oil is less, even with EROI dropping. Uh, they don't have to put as much energy into and as much cost into the process. Uh, and so we can see some, some apparent correlation uh, as the price, especially in this period here, uh, um, between the financial crisis in about 2012, 2013. As the price climbs back up, so does production climb back up as companies become more profitable, uh, they have more incentive. And as the world economy uh, came back to uh, growth phases as they recovered, then the people are using more oil, they're traveling more, and so there's more demand. Uh, there are a number of different uh, factors affecting price, uh, which then affects production. Uh, and then as price drops here in around 2014, 2015, again, we see production declining. This also probably relates to a, a period of lower demand. And then we see some erratic behavior in price. And in the end, this year with coronavirus, we're seeing a reduction in production along with the, the precipitous drop in price uh, due to a number of global factors. I, again, attempted to correlate these, these variables here. Alberta conventional and WTI price, are they share a very low significant correlation. Uh, that is it meaningful? Maybe, but there are a lot of other intervening factors. I, I would say that uh, it's not directly related. There, there are just too many other interfering variables. And we can see the scatter plot here much resembles non-conventional production and price where we see these lines intersect some of these data points, but they're too all over the place in order to come up with any kind of role. Even though our SPSS readout here says everything is, is highly significant, uh, we can't really trust these equations as being predictive of, uh, we can't take the price and then predict production based on uh, these empirical data. Similarly, in the United States, we have the WTA spot price, dollars per barrel, and you can see these are mildly correlated. This is uh, tight oil or unconventional shale oil in the United States. We see shale oil has been a boom in the U.S. And here's the, the one point where we can see there is some correlation between pricing and production again because once price falls below that forty fifty dollar range right which it does in this area here then it is no longer profitable and a company can't stay alive can't continue operating if it's not producing a profit uh, so companies having saved up enough money in this period where their the prices were quite high they could continue on uh, for some foreseeable future in hopes that the price will come back up above that break-even point uh, but as it drops and stays below $40, then this production will have to follow uh, unless companies can, can justify taking a loss, but they can't do that uh, in perpetuity. So, so that's production is, is, is affected by price, but not only, not only price and production are related in uh, trying to uh, determine what, what the global conditions, global environment and economics are. And we'll get to that in a moment here. Same thing with, with correlations. We have highly significant correlations between total output and tight output. And then this is actually more realistic, I think, than the Canadian example where there's no significant correlation between either total output or uh, tight, tight output and the spot price, right? It's not significant and there's no, there's no correlation. It's near, nearly a zero correlation. So these two lines here are basically doing their own thing. And that's what our friends at the World Bank have said there are a number of different causes 
Uh, this is referring to the 2014 drop in oil price. There, there are seven year, several years of upward surprises in the production of unconventional oil, weakening global demand, significant shift in OPEC policy, unwinding of some ge geopolitical risk, appreciation of the U.S. dollar, supply factors more than demand factors, supply capacity of relatively high cost and flexible producers such as the oil shale industry in the U.S. Uh, as as the oil price plunges, then they'll need to adjust to those lower prices, of course. Right, the consequences aside from those unconventional production companies, uh, consequences come for countries as well. Right, in oil, in oil importing companies, right, there's probably a net positive effect, and for the global economy overall, it's probably a net positive effect with the uh, oil price decline because then consumers can use oil uh, more easily, right? So we can see a supply-driven decline of 45% uh, would be associated to a 7 or 0.7 or 0.8 percent increase in global GDP, right? Over the medium term and temporary decline in global inflation. Uh, some people think that, well, Depends what what level inflation is, right? If if we see decline in, in global inflation, that's probably good for consumers. Uh, it depends what the average global inflation is. Whether economists would say that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, activity in oil importers should benefit from lower prices, since a drop in oil prices raises household household and corporate real incomes in a manner similar to a tax cut. The negative impact, of course, for exporters is immediate. For example, like Saudi Arabia or much of the Middle East, which relies on oil exports for a large portion of the economy. And then that can compound risks and exposure related to other financial market pressures. So oil price developments may also add volatility in financial and currency markets and affect capital flows, investment into and out of countries uh, as they're exposed to volatile oil market conditions uh, may change. Investment in the oil industry, of course, may fall sharply because it's no longer as profitable, right? It could also relate to declining agricultural process prices because food production tends to be energy, and energy intensive, right? So as the price of oil drops, then the cost to producers drops and then they can, uh, they, the result would be or could be a decline in their uh, prices. Right, and that would benefit the majority of the poor who don't have as much money to pay for food. Right, lower oil prices also present a window of opportunity for imp to implement structural reforms. Right, uh, to reform fuel subsidies. Fuel subsidies, governments give money to uh, big gas and oil industries in order to uh, promote the use of their fuels in order to reduce the prices for consumers uh, to spur economic activity for a number of different reasons, right? So they could assist poor households and support critical infrastructure and human capital investments. Uh, and in oil exporting economies, low oil prices uh, reinforce the need to redouble efforts to diversify activities. So in Saudi Arabia, for example, they've been pursuing this vision 2030 with the oil prices now quite low that even gives more incentive to diversify the economy into uh, other sectors. And so when looking at the long term, if EROI is decreasing and conventional oil is no longer as efficient and perhaps into the future in 50, 100 years time, uh, it will no longer be economically feasible to get it out of the ground. Uh, although it might be there, then we'll have to look at uh, some other sources. Uh, electricity, of course, is the number one competitor as far as transportation goes. How that's going to work for commercial air travel, nobody knows just yet. Uh, this article reviewed 162 papers and found EROI values for wind between 16 and 17, for solar between 5 and 34, so we have a wide range of efficiencies in photovoltaic solar panels, 
right? And then as far as biomass is concerned, we're not looking at much that's competitive with oil at all. In fact, we're not looking at much that's economically viable given that uh, bare minimum of three, right? And heat from industrial hemp, uh, there are a lot of political and legal policy issues relating to hemp, but that provides the, the best EROI uh, according to this author compared to a number of different sources. Uh, people have touted biodiesel and biogas and ethanol and things as being adequate or, or feasible substitutes for oil, but in fact the EROI is, is really quite low. And then say we have five to, five to six for ethanol from corn and low intensity agriculture or biogas from corn, but how much of our land can we put under corn? Uh, in, in, there's not nearly enough land, enough arable land presently to uh, plant corn to power uh, fleets of automobiles across even the United States, let alone the entire world. And so what we're seeing here is that there really isn't much competitive with oil as far as transportation, uh, which is why people are turning to electric, right? And then if we're looking at Replacing the transportation grids with electric cars, then uh, as far as GHGs or greenhouse gases are concerned, uh, which if you remember from the previous article we started to look at and uh, with regard to uh, unconventional or enhanced extraction or emissions intensity has been uh, increasing. GHG releases from oil industry has not been falling, even though oil production has been falling. And that's because they've been injecting steam and requiring more energy uh, to pull the same amount of oil out, or less oil out of the ground. And so if we're looking to uh, replace oil, then uh, going over to wind and solar, of course, is an option. However, uh, it's not always windy. It's not always sunny. And so we're, we're kind of at, we're stuck for looking for an answer of how to power all the vehicles. Uh, and so if we look at oh, there it was. Hydroelectric of course is a hydroelectric is a very efficient process, but hydroelectric requires damming of rivers which could displace people and threaten wildlife and other ecology. Uh, geothermal is really quite low on the EROI, although, again, these are renewable resources. Wind is a little higher than geothermal. All right, so we're looking at these renewable resources, natural gas and coal. Coal is not uh, a good option for the 21st century, although it is cheap, and that's why developing countries are using it quite a lot. Nuclear is also reasonably good on the EROI scale. It is cleaner as it doesn't produce GHGs compared to fossil fuels, coal, and natural gas, but there's the issue of storing waste and uh, also nuclear is non-renewable in that uranium supplies are limited. So looking at the two, three hundred year timeline, if in fact fusion is not uh, on, the, on the horizon and it, until we have it, 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 it isn't a real thing. Uh, then we're looking at replacing transportation networks with these renewable energies, uh, which some scientists and, of course, environmentalists would love. Um, but we're, what we're really seeing here is a number of different constraints. And into the future, that's, that's going to be a really ec interesting economic and technological question, how all of these different constraints of consumer demands and supply uh, can be in equilibrium in a world of, of growing population where there's increased uh, competition for resources uh, which are in fact decreasing and getting at least more difficult to get out of the ground and put together and transport across the world. And so I hope that wasn't too boring or confusing. Uh, so uh, that's something we can look at in into the future. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you.